Today's Fighting Hate from Home webinar will be how COVID-19 widens the gap for communities of color. For today's call, ADL CEO and National Director, Jonathan Greenblatt will be in conversation with the president of the National Urban League, Mark Morial. The National Urban League is the nation's largest historic civil rights and urban advocacy organization. Prior to joining, Mark served as the highly successful and popular mayor of New Orleans, as well as the president of the United States Conference of Mayors. He previously was a Louisiana state senator and was also a lawyer in New Orleans with an active and high profile practice. He is a leading voice on the national stage in the battle for jobs, education, housing, and voting rights equity. A graduate of Georgetown University Law School and the University of Pennsylvania, he has been recognized as one of the 100 most influential Black Americans by Ebony Magazine, one of the top 50 nonprofit leaders by the Nonprofit Times, one of the 100 most influential Black lawyers in America, and he has also been inducted into the Civil, International Civil Rights Walk of Fame in Atlanta, Georgia. At this time, it is my pleasure to turn the call over to Jonathan and Mark. Thank you. One of these days, we'll all figure out the mute button. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Deb, for that wonderful introduction. And hello to everyone who's joining us. I'm so pleased to have my, my colleague and friend, Mark Morial, on the uh, webinar with us today. I just want to share some initial opening thoughts, and then we'll kind of dive in for what I know will be a rewarding and rich conversation. So. I would say in addition to the sort of catastrophic medical and economic uncertainties that we face as a community, as a country, due to this unprecedented pandemic, ADL is deeply concerned with the virus's impact on our core mission, which compels us and has for 107 years to quote, seek justice and fair treatment to all. And I say that because COVID-19 has highlighted for ADL and many of our coalition partners like the National Urban League, just how much work is left to be done to secure just and fair treatment to all. As a global society, we're all worried about our physical health and have endless questions about the economic ramifications of this crisis. But as members of civil society, as an NGO committed to civil rights, we are deeply alarmed at the disparate impact of the coronavirus on marginalized communities and particularly communities of color. And we see it in the disproportionate health impacts. And we see it in the higher mortality rates. And we see it in the economic pain and how it's been distributed broadly and yet unevenly affecting so many of our frontline workers who are brown and black people. Added to those concerns as a set of worries about elevated hate and harassment, both on the ground and in cyberspace. And at ADL and on these weekly webinars, we've been talking about Zoom bombing, we've been talking about cyber harassment, and we've seen hate being targeted against Asian Americans, against Jewish communities. And this is happening at a backdrop when we know hate is on the rise, affecting all people based on the color of their skin or the way they worship, et cetera. And in this moment, when we all feel isolated, we've got to pull together as a community and collectively call out discrimination, hate mongering, which is why I couldn't be more pleased than to have Mark on the line with us today. You know, Mark has been not only a tireless champion for the African-American community, both as, an, as when he was the mayor of New Orleans or as the chair of the National Conference uh, of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and in his role as a public figure and a community activist running the National Urban League, he has been a stalwart champion of all marginalized communities. And so I can't think of a better partner and a more important friend than to have here today. So Mark, welcome hey, thank to Fighting Hate From Home. Hey, thank you. And Jonathan, I see you lifting up uh, Boston and Fenway Park. I've got my little New Orleans Pelicans. Oh, look at that. There you go. Uh, Bravo. Our, our hometowns, but 
Uh, let me thank you enormously and uh, thank the ABL community and the fam family of ABL uh, for inviting me for this discussion today, but also thank you and uh, for your friendship and uh, for your passionate leadership and for all of the uh, volunteers and, and, and leaders in the uh, Anti-Defamation League for their 100 years of service to the nation and for my family's longstanding relationship with ABL uh, going all the way back to the 1960s in New Orleans. So it's good to be with you even as we have this discussion in one of the most, perhaps the most challenging times uh, of our generation and, and a, a crisis of unprecedented proportion. It really is that. So there's so much stuff I want to talk to you about today, Mark, mm -hmm. but let's start if we could for a minute about how communities of color are experiencing the crisis. And look, we know there are Jews of color, right? They're all, color comes in a lot of variety, but particularly the African-American community. Give us some insights. Yeah, I, I mean, me, yeah, and I think we have to frame it this way. So. We've got, to, we've got to begin with this starting point. This uh, pandemic, the infection, the disease and the death affect everyone all across the globe. I don't think there's a nation on earth that's not been affected in some way, shape or form uh, by this pandemic. Uh, what we see in the United States uh, is that those with uh, health conditions such as diabetes, hypertension, asthma, when they catch the virus and when the virus infects them, uh, the impact of that is far more severe. Uh, and what we know in this country is that those types of health conditions are disproportionate in the African-American community and in the Latino community, but those conditions, hypertension, diabetes, uh, and asthma affect all Americans, but disproportionately African Americans, Latinx Americans, and we're also seeing those uh, of Native American and American Indian communities as well. And let me say this, and this is what's so important. You know, when the infection hit China, the lessons from China were that anyone with pre-existing health conditions, we're going to be much more at risk, much more susceptible to ending up on a ventilator and losing their life. So the warning signals were there. And in the early days of the pandemic, people resisted the notion that there was a disproportionate impact. Indeed, uh, it took a fight to just get the data and get the numbers. Uh, the hospitals and the Centers for Disease Control we're not really releasing any demographic numbers. We need to know, for intelligent decision making, the age, the race, the gender. We need to know the, the health profile of anyone who's been hospitalized and certainly anyone who may have died. We need to know that as uh, uh, it, it's good public health. Uh, it makes for good public health policy for us to know that. So we're seeing that. There's a long reason, long list of reasons as to why. What I'd also focus on is this sort of double whammy. Now we've got 30 million plus Americans out of work. Uh, we've got small business owners struggling to make ends meet just to hold their doors open. Uh, an, an incredible set of economic challenges that really, really stem from the fact that we are in a self-induced economic coma. It had to be induced. Mm -hmm. in order to save lives. Mm -hmm. And that to me, uh, the self-induced economic coma, is also, we're also seeing a disproportionate impact. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that when the Department of Labor uh, releases it, the jobs numbers tomorrow, which will really be the first picture we have of the jobs effect on the, of the pandemic, it's gonna show a high spike in overall unemployment, but a real high spike in black unemployment. So the economic side and the health side, you know, there are severe disproportionalities, but it's what pre-existed pan the pandemic. And so the pandemic is just wicked. Yeah, I want to, so let's start by drilling down on the health side for a second, because some yeah. of the stats I've seen, Mark, are unreal. And I don't know if the public, even our audience, they fully appreciates it. 
you know, some 13% of the American population is, is black, African American, Caribbean American, whatnot. Mm -hmm. But black patients make up more than 36% of the people who've been hospitalized with COVID-19. And here in New York, African Americans and Latinos are twice as likely to die from coronavirus as their white counterparts. And that's true in other parts of the country too. In urban Chicago, and in much more rural, uh, less urban Louisiana, which you know well, African Americans make up a third of the population, but 70% of the deaths. So, the question, and you know, you know, I think the real question uh, for all of us uh, is to understand at this moment, understanding what has happened, we have to radically rebuild the public health system in America. Radically rebuild. It's got to be rebuilt in a way that is going to focus on prevention and, and prevention interventions and not just sick care. It's got to be rebuilt in a way uh, where addressing health disparities is central to how we rebuild that public health system. The rebuilding of the public health system is a Washington issue, but it's an issue in every state capital. It's an issue in the boardroom of every private or academic hospital and teaching facility in America. We need an all out assault. We need a healthcare Marshall Plan, a 21st century healthcare Marshall Plan in the country. Look, I'm, it, it's confusing to me that uh, I heard uh, an eminent research doctor who's been working on the vaccine on television this morning and he observed that all of the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the materials, the ingredients, I guess, I don't know what you would call, what the proper word would be, used uh, to make the vaccine come from China, yeah. PPEs from China. Well, for our own sustainability and survival going forward, we need to shift some of that economic production to here in the United States so it's closer, so we are in better control, so we can create the kind of stockpiles we need if there's another pandemic or if this becomes some sort of boomerang uh, and affects us because it mutates and it, it, out, it, 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 it head fakes the vaccine. I mean, there's so many factors at stake. If you listen to the public health experts, and I am not one, but I respect and listen to what the public health experts are saying as all of us should do. This is their time. Uh, and, and I look to them for guidance on how we rebuild the public health system in America so that it can adequately serve each and every one of us. Well, it's interesting. I think you're making a really important point about how this crisis, how this virus has exposed the gaps and the cracks and the fault lines. But help me to understand, because a Marsh plan will help everybody, but I'm thinking particularly about in the systemic racism that I think underlies some of the inequities that prevail, right? Whether it's access to healthcare or access to testing, what's your perspective on that? You know, I'll use my, uh, you know, it's interesting. I'll use my uh, New Orleans as, as, as an example. Uh, you know, the New Orleans I grew up, I was born in the quote unquote black hospital. And the black hospital was Flint Goodrich Hospital. African Americans would either go to Flint Goodrich Hospital or they could go to the black, uh, the black division of Charity Hospital, which was the public hospital. Ultimately, when hospitals became integrated, interestingly, it was Turo Infirmary, uh, which was a, a Jewish community hospital that was one of the first to accept African Americans in New Orleans. There was simply there was a small cadre of doctors, so the issues of access to just basically a doctor and a hospital have historically been far more limited. Mm -hmm. uh, the access to insurance, mm -hmm. job with insurance, or the ability to purchase insurance on your own has been limited. And the Medicaid program and Medicare, Medicaid particularly, as, uh, as strong as that program is, always had limited eligibility. You know, it wasn't designed to be a universal program. So, access issues, then African Americans also historically uh, did the jobs that were the hardest, physically demanding jobs, working outside, working inside, lifting, carrying, 
uh, and the like. So there are lots of factors. So it's slavery, it's segregation, it's the legacy of discrimination, which has put us uh, where we are uh, in America today. And, and what we have to understand is, you see, some people want to beat the truth up. They want to beat up the truth. They want to beat up the facts because they either wish the facts weren't what they are, mm -hmm. wish the truth wasn't what it is, or the truth of the facts are too difficult for them. I said to a business leader today who um, I had a long talk with, and he is very concerned about healthcare disparities. And where our conversation ended up evolving to is, you know, these, the healthcare disparities are affecting his workers. They're affecting his customers. Yep. You know, we are intermingled and intertwined in the impact that health disparities have on the society. That's so, if I'm a person, I've got good health, I've got good health insurance, I have a great doctor, I have access to a high quality hospital, why should I be concerned? Why should I even care? Other than being a compassionate, understanding person. Because it affects the institutions of American life. It affects business, it affects the economy. We are inescapably intertwined in this country. And that requires us, uh, all of us, to be concerned and also to have and develop the public will to bring about uh, this kind of change. And, and, and I think it's within our reach. Uh, I think this is our Great Depression, World War II moment, our generation here in the early 21st century, when we have to imagine, we cannot be fearful, we have to be innovative, uh, and, and we have to dig deep because it's about what kind of nation we want to leave to our progeny. Yep, here, here. Well, so to that end, as we think oh. about the, the nation and what we want to leave for the next generation, we talk, you talk about a Marshall Plan. I mean, I think the effect and the jobs that was coming out tomorrow, the effect on the economy is, is I can't say it's Devastate. unprecedented. Again, we have the Great Depression 100 plus years ago. But you know, Mark, again, we know as often is the case that this economic instability is gonna disproportionately impact those who are least able to withstand it. And you know, the National Urban League's roots is an organization focused on economic self-sufficiency in the black community. Right. How are you think, was the CARES Act enough? Or how are you thinking about what needs to happen The CARES now? Act was at best a down payment. The enhanced unemployment benefits were an important down payment step by the government. Uh, the $1,200 paycheck, uh, I think, was an act of good faith, but it's been too slow and too laborious for them to get the money out of the door. Uh, that's bureaucracy, and so people are out there saying, when am I going to get any measure of relief? I think the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, its intent was good. Its design and execution were flawed. Uh, and I'll tell you why, for those that, you know, what they did with the Paycheck Protection Program, Jonathan, is they threw all of the SBA guidelines on what constituted a small business out of the window and came up with this standard of just 500 employees or less. So they allow, it allowed larger businesses, some publicly traded businesses, to swoop in, get in line first because they had banking relationships, and in effect, uh, be first to get the loans. You know, I believe that they should have created two pools of money, uh, multiple pools of money, one for smaller businesses, one for maybe medium-sized businesses, so that there would be a more equitable playing field uh, for small business owners. In just today, uh, Chuck Schumer, uh, and got Mnuchin to agree that monies being returned by the public who traded would go into, into a pool or a set aside for smaller businesses. So I'm hopeful that some of the carve outs that were created in round two, but these, these are just down payments. Look, we have got to recognize this could cost the federal treasury $10 trillion. But I say if it costs the fact that we're a strong, resilient nation, it, ha it has to be what it has to be because we've got to bridge people. We've got to bridge the states. 
We got to bridge the cities, bridge the small business owners. Nobody, the, ec the economic situation people face isn't their fault. Yeah. It has everything to do with the fact that we followed the guidance of public health officials to social distance, to quarantine, to turn to shut down businesses. So we shouldn't be blaming anyone. See, we shouldn't be saying, oh, this, oh, no, don't point the finger. Come together and say on a consensus basis, just like the country did in World War II, when we had to fight Nazi Germany and we had to fight Japan, we marshaled all of the resources, the private resources, the public resources of the nation because it was deemed to be survival. In my own mind and in my own word, this is World War III. Mm -hmm. It's an invisible enemy, but let's look at it. 69,000 people have lost their lives here in the United States since the beginning of the year. More of them lost their lives in Vietnam. And twice as many uh, people have lost their lives to COVID as typically lose their lives due to gun violence in a given year. Just to express the magnitude of, 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 of death. So it's, if it's hit you, your family and your friends, then it's more than statistics, it's more than personal. This is all since New Year's Day. This is all yeah. calendar year 2020. It's all unexpected. It's, it's, it's as though a, a tsunami of immense proportions hit every shore of every country from every ocean and body of water across the globe. And, and I believe that it is a challenge for all of us in leadership positions across the nation to step up and do what we can to help everyone get back on their feet. So uh, let me, I, I, there's so many questions I wanna ask you. I know we've got a lot of questions in the queue. Yeah. I wanna ask about what we can do as ADL, but I first need to kind of, as I warned you I would before, we're talking about COVID and we're talking about what it's doing to our communities. Mm -hmm. But as an organization that was founded based on a lynching outside of Atlanta, right. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about this sort of modern day lynching of Ahmed Aubrey. I mean, it's so painful. The video is-, is I saw that and, and I mean, I gasped. And, and all I can say is this, John, number one, Thank God for the video. Yeah. Thank God for the, uh, our ability to see with our own eyes. Otherwise, this story would have been twisted. Yes. The story would have been that he attacked someone, that he tried to jump someone. It would have been completely, you know, turned around. And it's, it's awful. And then the equivocation of law enforcement local law enforcement to hide behind the Georgia citizen arrest statute is an absolute and complete outrage. We need to be outraged. We need to demand that the United States Department of Justice and the United States Attorney conduct an investigation and arrest this guy immediately. He's an outlaw, full blood killer. Uh, there was no basis for him to do what he did, and he never thought he'd get caught. You see, if he knew he was being videoed, if he had any idea that he would would have been captured, he'd have sung a different tune. I and couldn't agree more. Our outrage, just all of us, right? So, you know, whether it's that, whether it's anti-Semitism, whether it's anti-Asian hate, I told my staff, uh, when we put out a statement against the anti-Asian hate, I said, look, understand, hatred is indivisible. Yep. People who hate, they got a reason to hate everything and everybody who they sense is not like them, right? And, and, and it, it, you know, this death of this young man is outrageous, and it, we should express our outrage in every single way we can and demand that William Barr, the attorney general, right, who wants to prosecute people for, investigate states for not opening themselves up, and do all kind of funny business with the Department of Justice, should front and center personally 
make he should he should use the power of the attorney general's office to say we're going to conduct an investigation we're going to look into this matter and we will ensure that justice is done so do you think we can get a fair and impartial federal investigation I mean, we want a transparent independent investigation i'm going to ask you can we get that from this justice department what do you think you know you know my instincts tell me it's hard to sense that we would because they have no track record of investigating or prosecuting hate crimes. There's no real track record of either investigating or prosecuting civil rights complaints. But whatever we think, it's our responsibility as citizens and our right as citizens to demand that the people that work for us enforce the law 100%. and that they do it with all speed, all due aggressiveness, and we have to demand it. We have to demand it. So I'm, I'm gonna, you know, I don't even wanna say, you know, my instincts tell me it's hard to get a fair investigation outside of this Justice Department, but I'm calling for public pressure, public outrage. So if you're on social media, speak out against this case. Uh, elected officials, celebrities, and others, we all have to rally around what was in effect a modern day lynching. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I tweeted about it this afternoon. And we need it. We need the culprits brought to justice. justice. And we need justice for Ahmed Aubrey, period, end of story. I mean, it's just, it's, it's an appalling. It, it's ridiculous. And you know, we as an organization, I think ADL has been so powerful and so strong in lending its voice, its moral voice against hate and hate crimes uh, wherever, uh, wherever it emanates from. And, and I'll say to all of your members and volunteers around the country, their voice is, is, is incredibly influential uh, on social media, in social circles, uh, with elected officials, uh, that voice is really important. This is about building public will. Here, here. All right, Deb, we've got a lot of questions in the queue. I can see 58. So do you want to uh, walk us through some of them? Absolutely. Uh, it's been a really populated question and answer today. So there have been a variety of questions that have stemmed around some similar themes. So I'll try and group them accordingly. Uh, and the first is you've talked to several of these, but maybe in a more concise answer all lined up. What do you see uh, as the top contributing factors that have exacerbated the impact of COVID-19 on communities of color? I think Mark, the communities of color have been impacted by the slow uh, federal response. The loss of two to three weeks at the very beginning had a, has had a dramatic impact on communities of color. Uh, the unavailability of testing uh, and the lack of access issues to doctors uh, and hospitals for communities of color meant many times a later response or a response when uh, the virus was having a more acute effect on people. Yeah, and the follow-up to that question, which has been repeated over and over throughout the chat as you, as both of you were speaking consistently, what are the actions that people can take to help address some of these issues? And I should just add to that, that, you know, to the previous question, longstanding inequities are the foundation uh, but in the immediate term, those longstanding inequities produced uh, an environment uh, where, 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 and an attitude where the testing was less available, where access was just not the same across the board. So at this point in time, uh, I think we've got a couple of things. I think for us, uh, we have to build the public will to do the right thing in reopening the economy and to do the right thing, which means making equity central to the rebuilding of the public health system, and to do the right thing as testing and treatment and vaccines become available so that it is available to all. I think our voice, our voice at, in the political square, in the public square is 
is, is really important. But, but also, to those of us who can, and uh, you know, our organization has a human and social services base uh, of work we do, we also have an immediate challenge. Uh, one immediate challenge we have is helping people survive, whether it's making sure they have food, whether it's making sure that their children have clothing, whether it's making sure that they're not evicted or foreclosed on, that work has to also be done. And that's the immediate work that we can't forget while we work on long-term change. So uh, there are a number of, if you will, tracks, channels that we have to work on. Here, here. And I guess I would just say that, you know, from ADL's perspective, we're very focused on fighting hate and to make sure that the system supports, you know, equity and justice. So, I mean, like we're looking at voting access and worried and want to care deeply, make sure we get the voting access we need heading into the fall. Make sure that the systems that support our elections, like the post office, work the way they're supposed to as we head into this fall. Make sure that uh, systems like the census, which yeah. determines, you know, the allocation of resources, which flows into this stuff, is being done in an equitable and and fair manner. So there's a there's a lot of I'm, I'm so glad uh, you raised voting and the census. And uh, I think we're absolutely aligned on the idea that there ought to be no excuse absentee ballots available across the lane. But then I would add to that that we need early voting across the land. So those that want to vote in person can do it in an environment where social distancing is possible. And that can't be done with every, everyone cramming into a poll on election day. Congress took a positive step and put some money out there, but there's still recalcitrant states. Mm -hmm. That uh, absentee ballot ought to be mailed to people with a prepaid uh, return envelope so that there's no postage expense associated with returning the ballot. And I would argue that it ought to be like, it ought to be sent to everyone, right? Regardless as to whether they ask for it or not. So we need to do everything we can to make voting far more efficient, far more available. That's what a democracy is based on. It's based on the universality of the suffrage. Here, here. Yeah, it sounds so easy. Do the right thing, as you said earlier, and yet it's such a complicated and layered process. Uh, another question that came up in several different ways. Do you know, are there people who are tracking the incidence of death and of illness and the severity within colors of community uh, excuse me, communities of color around COVID-19. Are there people who are tracking this data and, and better, to, better able to address it because of that? Well, Jonathan, you want to go? You want me to go on that one? I don't know the answer to that question. So I think the answer is we, we, sh we have a right to rely on the Centers for Disease Control uh, to, be, uh, to be the authority and the place where comprehensive, reliable, accurate data is stored. Uh, at the hospital level, there's a form that CDC has prepared that is supposed to be uh, completed and sent to the Centers for Disease Control, which creates a, a basis of information. But the reason why it may be not complete is because it only measures those who've been hospitalized not necessarily those who've not been hospitalized. And then the large number of people who, uh, who, who have been maybe not formally diagnosed by a physician, but had COVID at the beginning. I have a family member who was in that situation, had it for a week or two, couldn't get tested in the early going because of the lack of availability of the tests. Uh, and have no idea whether she is included in, in any of the statistics. I also uh, have come to uh, rely on Johns Hopkins. Johns Hopkins has done a great public service uh, with their COVID website. And, and I might add uh, that they're doing a number of briefings uh, on COVID. And so we're relying, I think, on them 
uh, to do it. But but in terms of comprehensiveness, the line with that, I think more information is going to have to be called. I don't think we have a complete picture of this. Yeah. To switch gears a little, have either of you on behalf of your organizations interacted with the COVID-19 task force? And how have you handled COVID-19 within your organizations? The COVID-19, the federal COVID-19 task force? I think that's what they meant. Well, we, we have not interacted with them uh, in, in any way. Uh, we've not been invited to interact with them, but I uh, agreed to serve on Governor Cuomo's uh, reopening of the economy commission, uh, New York Forward task force that was just created. We held our first meeting. It's being uh, headed by a lawyer by the name of Steve Cohen, who uh, formerly worked for Governor Cuomo. Uh, and and we're, we're, we're liaising with them here in the state of New York, where we're headquartered uh, as, 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 as the National Urban League. But no real engagement. Uh, I've had some engagement with the Department of Labor, uh, Federal Department of Labor around jobs and workforce. I've had some engagement with the United States Department of, Con of Commerce uh, regarding uh, minority businesses and how they're faring and what we can do in those areas, but no engagement with the, the quote unquote the administration's task force. Yeah, same here. I mean, I have not heard from the coronavirus task force at the White House. I think there are multiple ones from what I understand from my reading the paper. Uh, I would say, I mean, within our organization, you know, we've been We've been on top of this since late February, and we've tried to, you know, we've tried to take precautions, uh, first and foremost, to protect our staff and our supporters. Mm -hmm. I mean, people are really our priority at ADL. The, you, people are our assets, relationships are the value. And so we have erred on the side of maybe being overreaching a little bit and doing more to make sure that people are cleared out of our offices, everyone can work from home, everyone has the time they need, and we're just, you know, we haven't laid anyone off or made any furloughs or any personal adjustments. We're trying very hard to put people first. We are too. And, you know, uh, that's uh, you, the principle you express. You know, I embrace, uh, and that is you've got to put your people first, their health, their safety, and their families, uh, and, and make that the highest priority. I mean, I've got a small uh, initiative underway now on our staff, a group of people working on scenarios of how we will reopen, either gradually or partially with conditions, with tests and masks and physical distancing in the office. I mean, all of us are gonna have to pay attention to that. And then we, uh, we wanna understand it so that we can provide guidance and information to other institutions in the community. Yeah, I would think you've got many chapters across the country, Mark. I mean- We've got 90. So that's and pretty hard, they are, right? They are, 90 and 2,000 employees. So do you make the call about who goes where? Or do the local chapters decide? They make the call, and I've got an incredible group of uh, local leaders. They make the call, and we offer guidance and feedback. Uh, but I have to say, in this instance, uh, they knew instinctively what to do. We've been hosting conference calls of all of our local leaders every 10 days or so. And one of the things we do on the calls is we give four or five aff affiliate leaders a chance to be heard so we can do a best practices learning conversation. But we, we're publishing, you know, we'll publish a guidance, we'll offer information. Uh, but, you know, I have confidence in, in the talent uh, of our leaders uh, to do the right thing. And many of them, almost to a person, have continued to keep their doors open, but they're doing work virtually, they're providing services virtually. They've leaned into the COVID uh, situation. They're doing feeding and virtual career fairs. Uh, lots of important work. You know, we are economic first responders. I mean, during the recession, uh, we served uh, 2 million people a year in those difficult years of 2010, 2011, 2012, uh, when unemployment rates were double, uh, in double digits in the country, and black unemployment rates were near 20. Uh, so, we have, uh, I think, a, a level of experience in, I think, understanding what communities are going to need. Uh, but I also think we've learned some lessons from both 
the recession and Katrina, but if you're not intentional about transformation and restructuring, it won't happen. You'll mm -hmm. simply put Humpty Dumpty back on the wall the same way he was before he fell. Yeah, it's a really great point. Um, Mark, I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to the historical inequities that have affected business owners uh, in communities of color, specifically uh, in the past, but also in this economy and what you think going forward will, will be the case. You know, it's uh, for, for, for business owners, African-American business owners is a question focused on black business owners. The black business owners, I mean, if we've got about 2.5 million African-American businesses in the country, we've got maybe a handful, three or four, that have gross revenues that exceed a billion. Uh, even the largest African-American owned businesses in the country might barely make the Fortune 1000 list. So uh, they are relatively uh, uh, much smaller uh, than, than, than their counterparts. And it's been access to capital and access to risk capital and equity capital that's made it uh, more difficult for African-American businesses uh, to grow, I think is one thing. And I think it's lack, it's sometimes lack, it's lack of access to connections that produce contracts and supply opportunities that also, so black businesses uh, in the modern era have, uh, have relied on supply diversity programs, uh, have relied on uh, minority business programs from cities and states and the federal government. Not completely, but that's been an important driver, a driving opportunity for many African-American-owned businesses. So I'd say if you asked an African-American business owner, they'd say capital, capital, capital. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, Jonathan, uh, you know, this is really for both of you. Uh, the President of the United States has referred to COVID-19 as the Chinese virus. Has anyone from ADL or from your organization, Mark, as well, have you spoken to anyone within the organization, uh, with, excuse me, within the administration about this racist rhetoric? We um, may. Go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, so we've spoken out about this repeatedly. Just to be clear, it it is a it is a fact that the virus appears to have originated in China. It is a fact that the earliest reports were specifically in the Wuhan province. It is a fact that a number of kind of infectious diseases seem to have originated in China in recent years. And it is a fact that the government in Beijing, which is a tyrannical government, which is prone to misinformation itself, uh, has withheld facts and has not been reliable and, you know, it manipulates information, represses its own people. All these things are true. And yet, it is also undeniable that today we see, because we track this at ADL, we see Asian American people, people who are perceived to be Chinese nationals or perceived to be of Chinese descent, being accosted and assaulted on the street being harassed in public places, being, uh, being uh, attacked online. We've seen waves of bullying at schools. And so we want our leaders to lead. And I would say leadership, uh, uh, quality leadership has a moral dimension to it. And knowing that there are those among us, American or not, by the way, Okay, um, but there are those among us who might be uh, again uh, of Chinese descent or perceptibly of East Asian ethnicity, being attacked in the street, being assaulted, being scapegoated and stereotyped. Leaders who spend all their time talking about China and who don't find a way to counterbalance that and say, "But don't attack, don't hold responsible all Chinese people for the acts of the government." It's it's irresponsible. And it's wrong. And you know, I can find many examples um, of, of other leaders who didn't do this. I don't know, for example, George Bush after 9-11, intentionally going to a mosque to pray to make the point that this was a war against, you know, radical jihadists, not against all Muslims. 
or for example, many leaders from both parties who may call out certain activities of different governments. Let's say, government of Israel, you may disagree with policies, but all Jews aren't responsible for that. And you need to take great pains to say that clearly and consistently. And I, why we don't see that at the top is it, it's rather inexplicable to me. The unfortunate thing that, you know, the president has race baited. Um, and, and that's not something that I expect presidents to do. What do I mean by race baiting? Well, he, his first announcement as a, as a candidate for president involved a pejorative characterization of Mexico and people of Mexican descent. So it, 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 it's designed to race bait, but it's also designed to shift responsibility, point fingers, assign blame. Look, I call it pin the tail on the belt. Let me just find somebody out there and I'll tell them that, see, they're, they're, they're responsible. They're, they're the ones responsible. It's a continuing pattern. It, it's, to me, it's tiring. To me, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's old, it feels old, it seems old, in addition to being just a, a perpetuation uh, of hatred. And Jonathan's right in terms of the statement of the facts, but in this environment, it ought to be called what it is. It's called COVID-19, yeah. right? It's called the COVID-19. It has a name. Yeah. It doesn't need a nickname. Yeah. It doesn't need a characterization. It doesn't need a pejorative, uh, uh, clever reality show, uh, if you will, descriptor. Call it what it is. And call it what it is because if it's serious and we're serious about thwarting it, let's call it what it is. It's called COVID-19. It's called the coronavirus. Not anything else. Not susceptible to a nickname. You don't give diseases to make names because you're trying to gain some, and, and I, I just sometimes think that, uh, you know, it's just not what leadership, moral leadership in this country's history, whether it was Roosevelt in the 1930s, whether it was Johnson and Kennedy during civil rights, whether it was George W. Bush after 9-11, uh, you could cite examples, whether it was Barack Obama's response uh, to the uh, economic crisis that we faced as a country. We expect our leaders to bind us together, to build us as one, to stitch together, to uh, marshal our best angels uh, in, in an effort to go forward. We don't expect uh, Finger pointing, game playing to continue, which is just an, an, an example of sure responsibility. And and I just I think what it what it spurred in terms of hate against Asian Americans was just absolutely despicable, uh, uncalled for. Just another example of a hate crime. And we, Jonathan, you stood up. Uh, I stood up, and, and I will continue to stand up because we have to stand up to each other because this hatred is indivisible. It's a cancer. It's a, it's, a, it's a social cancer and a social disease, and we have to stand up to it, and we have to, we have to instruct and teach our children that it's unacceptable. You're here. Thank you for that. So this next, this next question is a, it's a little bit tough. But Mark, how worried should people of color be about institutional racism and racism infiltrating the healthcare system in general? Yeah, I think people should be uh, diligent and concerned, but we can't tackle a problem if we let fear to absorb us and engulf us. And, and that's the history of struggle. That's the history of struggle. I don't, across the lands, right? Whether it was those struggling uh, against slavery, whether it was the great uh, Harriet Tubman, whether though it was those who struggled uh, during the Holocaust and, and fought 
uh, for freedom and escape to freedom. It's always been, you know, courage that we have to dig deep so we cannot be fearful, but we have to have sometimes a little healthy dose of limited paranoia and diligence is okay, but it can engulf us and begin to be a guiding principle. And, and I, I think this structural and institutional racism is stubborn. You know, you wonder if back in the 1960s, at the time of the passage of the historic civil rights bills, if they would have looked ahead and said, you know, 60 years hence, we're still going to be dealing with the remnants uh, of the systems that existed beforehand. Uh, and uh, they may have said yes, they may have said no, but we have got to continue to work uh, for what I call a better nation, a nation that's fair. And look, I still have faith. I have faith in the nation. I have faith that the people of goodwill, the people of goodwill will lose battles, but will ultimately win the war. I like that statement very much. And before we let you go, and, and Jonathan, I'm gonna ask you this too. So Mark, I, you were just asked about what to be worried about. So I'm gonna ask you, what's one thing that makes you hopeful in these moments? Jonathan or Mark? Yeah. Uh, Mark, you start, then I'll throw it to Jonathan. You know, what makes me hopeful is to really align with people who are on this ADL webinar today. It's to align with other people who, who have the same sense of outrage, but also the same sense of commitment and the same sense of passion. That's what makes me hopeful. What makes me hopeful is to see others doing good work, to see others helping out, to see others fighting and pushing. That's what inspires me, uh, to see others, because then you know you're not here by yourself. You're not on your own. You're not in isolation. You're not going to be absorbed by, 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 by this sense of, 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 am I the only one that has these feelings and has this perspective? And, uh, uh, you know, it's great. And I, I, I thank uh, ADL and the terrific energy uh, of, uh, of its leaders and volunteers and staff across the nation. Look, we're bound together. Uh, you know, Jonathan has been a collaborative leader. You know, we're always texting each other when something happens and uh, we're communicating about how can we both work together? How can I help? Uh, how can you help? And, 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 and that's, to me, uh, the kind of collaboration that uh, I think works. And it's the only way to lead in the 21st century. We have to reach out and we have to recognize that uh, uh, there's great, great power in coalition building and in, and in alliances. I mean, Mark, took the words out of my mouth. <clears throat> I have hope because of the extraordinary allies who cross the spectrum come together. I have hope because I think our greatest days are still ahead of us, not behind us. I have hope because the kind of innovation I've seen breathed into the civil rights movement, breathed into community organizations like the National Urban League and ADL in recent years, have shown us that you know the journey is is long, but we'll, we will get there. So uh, every single day, I'm grateful for the friendships and grateful for the support. And I think that's why we stand with the National Urban League today, and with our other allies, and are prepared arm in arm to kind of walk together into the future that we want. And we stand with you, and uh, we appreciate you. Let's let's get together again. Uh, uh, let's continue to collaborate. Let's continue to work. Uh, we had a long battle, and uh, I just want to lift up. All all healthcare uh, physicians and nurses and nursing assistants and uh, orderlies and aides and custodians and the people that are, they're the true soldiers, they're the true uh, warriors, they're the, they're the Marines, they're the D-Day the invaders uh, of this pandemic. Here, 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 here. Well, thank you both for your leadership and, and thanks thank, you. For, thank you so much for being with us. And, and thanks to everyone joining us today via computer. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time. 
But uh, we're so grateful that you chose to spend the afternoon with us. And we hope you'll join us next week for Fighting Hate from Home, where we're going to be discussing ADL's 2019 Audit of Anti-Semitic Events, which will be released next week. We'll be meeting on Thursday, May 14th at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time, and details of that will be hitting your inbox soon. With that, have a great afternoon and stay safe and continue to be well.